Hello and thanks for joining us on Encore. Coming up on today's show. It's the biggest book fair in the world with more than 7,000 stands from over 100 countries. We head to Frankfurt's annual literary get together featuring this year's guest of honor, French writing from around the world. And if you can't make it to MoMA, MoMA comes to you. A new exhibition brings the best of New York's modern art to Paris. It's the yearly appointment for the publishing industry. Frankfurt's Book Fair is a must for authors, editors, translators and, of course, book lovers from around the world. This year, the organisers are shining a light on the very best in French-speaking literature, inviting France to set up a special pavilion in the fair. Emmanuel Macron was in Frankfurt to open the event alongside German Chancellor Angela Merkel, and the French president saluted the arts as a cornerstone of European unity. I went to Frankfurt to check it out. Willkommen, welcome to Frankfurt's Book Fair, the world's largest publishing event where deals are done, prizes awarded and hundreds of thousands of books are launched, translated or optioned for films. It's not only the biggest book fair, it's also the oldest. After the printing press was invented almost 600 years ago, just down the river in Mainz, local merchants would gather nearby to sell their texts and they're still doing that on a much larger scale today. Oh, it's, so it's so big. I'm always worried I'll miss something. It's the biggest book fair in the world. It's unmissable for those in publishing and for anyone involved with books. Five days is too short if you want to see it all. There are visitors from all over the world. The good thing about the French pavilion is that it's a very specific selection, so it's not too overwhelming. Every year, the fair invites a guest country to show off its literary talents, and this year that honour goes to Germany's friend and neighbour, France. As for its ambassadors, almost 200 French-speaking authors are making an appearance for readings, panel discussions, exhibitions and workshops. The French pavilions looking beyond Europe's borders, inviting French-speaking authors from around the world. Belgium, Benin, Haiti, Lebanon and Canada are all represented here, united by a common tongue. I'm joined by Daniela Ferrière, a Haitian, Canadian author and member of the Académie Française. Thanks for joining us. I'd like to ask you about your literature, which comes to us by way of Haiti and Montréal, uh, but you write in French. Can you tell us about your relationship with the French language? It's what allows me to write books. But the first thing that's important to a writer is the story, adventure, emotions, and the music to the language, a certain rhythm. And if we can manage to transmit all of that with one language, it's wonderful. You're the first writer from both Haiti and Quebec to be elected to the Académie Française, a very prestigious institution, and one of their missions is safeguarding the French language. The Académie Française has a reputation sometimes of being a bit conservative, perhaps a bit rigid in its approach to the language. What's your opinion? Do you think that the French language should be more flexible? We're not trying to be the police of the French language, not at all. We give great importance to spoken French, to day-to-day -day language. But what we are a bit reticent about is the sort of double-speak, which ends up being adopted by people who spend too much time watching politicians speaking on TV. The only thing which can word that off is literature. And I think that if we read a lot, we can avoid aping that sort of meaningless language. Alongside some cutting-edge innovations in the publishing industry, there's also a replica of some 15th century technology and arguably the most important invention in the history of books, the Gutenberg Press. Authors are invited to come and print their own books by hand. Lebanese comic book artist Zeyna Abirached is giving it a try. 
Zeyna, you've just printed a page from your book, Le Piano Oriental, in French, which is your mother tongue, along with Arabic. You grew up speaking both languages. And is French perhaps a professional language for you? I'm often asked why I don't write in Arabic. There's a reply I really like from Atel Adnan, a Lebanese writer, a poet, when she was asked the same thing. She says, I write in French, but I draw in Arabic. In fact, your drawings or illustrations are inseparable from your writing. Do you think there are some things you can't say with literature or words? It's difficult to unpick them. They really go together. What's great about graphic novels and drawing in general is that you can say things that it would take pages to say using just text. We can say that in just one drawing because the emotions transmitted immediately by the illustration the design of the page. Your work is translated into many different languages. How does it feel to see your books in a foreign language? It's really wonderful to turn the pages and not be able to read what we've written ourselves. And you write about personal things, your family, your childhood, but also necessarily political things about Beirut in the 1980s when the war was going on. Why do you think art, literature, graphic novels are the best platform to talk about these issues? Well, I chose to talk about all of those issues, all of those memories, by approaching them from a more intimate, personal perspective and not just give, I don't know, a very direct account, but something that I get into in a roundabout way. To make the characters talk personally about what they think of the Civil War, as opposed to showing the Civil War head on. And for that, graphic novels are just perfect. They provide us with these little tools like the ellipse, the aside, these things that are part of the language of comics and that we all have at our disposal. As well as celebrating the authors of today, the French Pavilion's also focusing on younger readers and potentially the writers and illustrators of tomorrow with a selection of some of the best in children's literature. We'll leave you with some of the highlights. And if that particular space at Frankfurt's Book Fair looks like a very well-stocked library, that's thanks to the association Biblionef, which provided 40,000 books for the shelves of the French Pavilion. But those shiny new releases are just on loan for the duration of the fair because the books will soon be making their way to young readers around the world. The association was created 25 years ago to bring a wide choice of contemporary literature to children and teenagers, particularly in countries where access to new books is limited. Bibliofs director told us a little bit more about their work. See, we've created more than 3,000 libraries in more than 100 countries on every continent. That's three and a half million new books that have been sent. And that's not dumping. They are specially selected, carefully chosen books targeted for readers. So we've reached at least 100 million children, giving them more access to books and reading. It's a monument to modernism, a New York institution. Now some of its masterpieces are coming to Paris. Being Modern, MoMA in Paris is a new exhibition at the Louis Vuitton Foundation. It's a chance for art lovers to see more than 200 masterpieces of modern art that usually reside in New York. Examples of minimalism, pop art and abstract expressionism are on display. Charles Pellegrin takes a look. From Roy Lichtenstein to Cindy Sherman, to Andy Warhol. The canon of American modern art is in Paris, while the MoMA goes through renovation works. It's a project that took us a long time, that brings together the Louis Vuitton Foundation and MoMA. The goal is to show a selection of masterpieces from the American Museum's collection, while at the same time telling the story of 20th century art through the eyes of MoMA. The exhibit is not just a one-way street. Some works are, in a way, coming home. Paul Cézanne's The Bather, or Marcel Duchamp's Bicycle Wheel, for instance. So from its beginnings, the Museum of Modern Art was deeply committed to the French avant-garde. Central to our collection are artists like Cézanne and Gauguin, but also Picasso and Matisse and Léger. And Alfred Barr, the founding director, was deeply influenced by what was happening in Paris at the turn of the century. But the MoMA is more than just a receptacle for modern classics. It's a place where art keeps evolving 
and where contemporary creators can express themselves. In his work, Measuring the Universe, Slovakian conceptual artist Roman Ondak invites visitors to leave a trace of their presence in the exhibit whilst replicating a family ritual. And this, this work was also inspired by the habit of people to measure children and to see kind of record of the time, because the time is also a very important element in this work. And just as a child grows taller year after year, so does art. And a museum like the MoMA is there to record it. That's being modern. Star-crossed lovers on the mean streets of New York, one of the catchiest scores in memory and some breathtaking dance numbers. I am, of course, talking about West Side Story, which is now coming to the west side of this city, Paris. Sondheim and Bernstein's classic musical is on stage at La Seine Musicale, a new performing arts and concert venue here in the French capital. We'll leave you with a little taste of that show. Don't forget to check out our website and you can keep up with Encore on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Reporters Plus, presented by Mark Owen. A hundred years ago, the Russian Revolution changed the face of the world. What remains today, and why is the Kremlin so bothered by its centennial? There are those whose families fled to exile and escape of the Bolsheviks' repression, and the nostalgics for a certain societal model. France 24 brings you an exclusive report on the history of an uncomfortable anniversary, Russia's ghosts of 1917. Reporters Plus on France 24 and France24.com.